we call the first logical negation and the second real opposition. In the first case, we have the contradictory opposition, A is B and is not B, for instance, white and not white. In the second, the contrary opposite, for instance, white, black. Now, the question is that according to uh, Hegel, he has produced the third term, this is the key issue, through the self-division of the concept. Uh, otherwise, if there was no third term derived from the contradic two contradictory judgment, there would not be possible to advance in the dialectical succession. But if we remain at the a pure, a logical level, to say this is A and this is not A, is impossible from this contradiction to find a third term. So, perhaps some people have argued what Hegel meant all the time was real opposition and not logical contradiction, so that the uh, dialectical succession was constituted through uh, 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 the confrontation between forces in which the third element could not be derived from the simple contradiction of the first two elements. <coughs> well, except for something, and here is where Trendelenburg introduces his um, uh, uh, main uh, uh, argument. Is it possible to derive a real third term through a purely logical analysis? Well, the, the answer to this question is simply unnecessary. It's obvious that it is not possible to do such a thing. In that case, uh, what uh, uh, Hegel does, this is the main argument of Trendelenburg, that later the De La Volpian follow, and which I would tend to accept as well, is that it's a hybrid because constantly mixed in a, a non-valid way, in an inconsistent way, the categories of real opposition and a logical contradiction. Marx had uh, himself realized already this in his uh, useful writings, which were very much inspired by Feuerbach, when he said that uh, on the one hand, Hegel presents a, an acritical idealism. This is the part concerning um, a logical contradiction. But on the other hand, because he introduces his third term, simply smuggling it into the argument without the proper derivation, he incur, incurs in the opposite vice, which is an acritical positivism. And so there is where things stand in this a matter. The question is that um, there is no possibility of uh, transcending this duality which has been introduced into the analysis. Now, what about the second part of the assertion of the De La Volpians, that uh, and social antagonism are real oppositions. I'm going to take issue with this um, assertion. I don't think that the category of real opposition is at all useful to understand uh, social antagonisms, simply because in, social ant in, in a real opposition there is nothing antagonistic. If the two, if two stones clash and one of them is broken, and the, the broken stone expresses uh, its own being as much as the other stone. So it's a whole process which takes place in the physical world in the same space of a representation and the, la, the essential characteristic of the antagonism, which is to be a relation between uh, enemies is entirely absent from the, um, uh, what the real opposition uh, brings about. So, while in the real opposition we have um, uh, expression of 
the identity of the two forces opposed without antagonism, in the case of antagonism, there is an interruption of the identity of, of both. That is to say, there is a very chasm which, by which none of the two forces reaches its full identity because of the presence of the other. So retain this point because it's going to be important for what I will say later on. There is interruption of identity in the case of antagonism when there is no interruption of identity in the case of the real opposition. In fact, Coletti, for instance, gets indignant with, the Marxist, with Marxist philosophers because he says that they have systematically ignored the Kantian category of real opposition, real repugnance. Uh, and he uh, 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 sustained that the, this is um, 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 an incredible uh, blunder. Now, I don't think that the <coughs> Marxist philosophers actually ignore the category of real position. Lukács was a professional philosopher, and in order to ignore the category of real position, he should have not read the critique of your reason, which is unthinkable. <laughs> what I think is that, that uh, has happened is that the Mar that Marxist philosophers were not tempted by the category of real opposition simply because they realize that in this opposition there is nothing which is negative, while negativity is of the essence of the antagonism. The point is that the only um, uh, negativity which was available to them was the dialectical negativity. So they continue speaking about negativity in the dialectical sense, in which obviously they were mistaken. So, but we think we reach a crossroads. Um, because if antagonisms are, not, are neither real opposition, nor logical contradiction, what the hell they are? <laughs> <laughs> that is what I want to address uh, now. <laughs> the, thesis, the main thing is that I want to present to you, which is a, in a um, summary way already present in our book, Hegemony on Social Strategy, that is at the center of the new book that I'm preparing now, is the following. That real opposition and logical contradiction share something in common, and is the fact that both of them are objective relation between conceptual objects in the case of contradiction, between real objects in the case of the real opposition. And what is the characteristic of an objective relation that I can pass from one extreme of, uh, the, of what is represented to the other without interrupting at all the same space of representation. That is, in the case of um, um, an objective relation, all the elements intervening in the relation appear at the same level of representation. Now, here we have a, the problem that I was mentioning before, that there is an interaction <coughs> of uh, the identity of the two forces um, entering into the antagonist, antagonism, and as a result, that both of them cannot belong to the same space of representation. To give an example that I have analyzed elsewhere, if we, if we have, for instance, the clash between a, a group of landowners and the, a, a peasant community that they are trying to expel from the land, from the point of view of the um, um, landowner, the peasant uh, um, resistance is seen as pure irrationality. That is to say, it is not something simply objective, 
it is something which prevents the landowner process to be um, continued, to be followed. In the case of the peasant community, exactly the same thing <coughs> happened. That is to say, I can represent the process as seen by the landowner and as seen by the peasant, but the specific antagonistic moment, the moment of the clash, the, uh, is something which escapes representation. There is no possibility of having a complete representation of the whole process, except if we introduce here a third man. That is to say, something which sees the process from outside and finds a meaning to this process, which, uh, uh, and this meaning does not coincide with the uh, vision of either the person or the landowners. So, this third man, obviously, is the absolute spirit in the Hegelian sense. And uh, as you know, Hegel presented history as something which escaped the understanding of all the actors entering in the historical process. He, uh, his famous formula is the one of the um, um, cunning of reason. He says, for instance, at the beginning of the philosophy of history, that his universal history is not the terrain of happiness. And he uh, says that history for the actors intervening in it is, appears as irrational, dominated by evil, by, um, uh, dominated by violence. But through this apparent irrationality, something much deeper, a rationality that escapes any kind of understanding by the social agent, is actually taking place. So, being seen from the <coughs> point of view of the uh, absolute spirit, rationality and reality are one and the same. You know the Hegelian formula, everything that is rational is real, anything that is real is rational. And Marx asserted uh, very much the same kind of a thing. He said, at the beginning of history, we have, <coughs> the, uh, we have primitive communism, which was a non-antagonistic form of society. Later on, however, in order to develop the productive forces of humanity, we have to pass through the whole hell of class-divided societies. And only at the end of the process, in a reconciled society of a mature communism, the meaning of all this apparent violence and irrationality will reveal itself. So that uh, the process of history, as history of production, which is what is for Marx, uh, the whole process of history is rational through and through. If you see, for instance, the preface to the critique of political economy, where uh, uh, Marx uh, uh, presents the, the guiding uh, uh, thread of his research, he says, from the point of view of uh, an objective history, we can detect it meaning, it meaning with the precision of a natural process. On the other hand, there is the way in which this process is reflected 